Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to the Rajan Kilachan Mughal Tent. This next session is called Innovations in Healthcare, the India Example, and it's presented by Access Health International. Uh, here with us, we have Siddhartha Bhattacharya, who is Country Director for Access Health International in India. Uh, he's previously served in a number of key leadership roles, including positions with Dell, Philips, and as Chief Operating Officer and Technology Head for the Emergency Management and Research Institute of JVK. We also have William A. Hesseltine, who is the Chair and President of Access Health International, a non-profit organization he co-founded in 2007. Dr. Hesseltine has an active career in both science and business, well known for his pioneering work on cancer, HIV AIDS, and genomics. He's authored more than 200 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and several books. Uh, and moderating our conversation, we, ha we have Amrita Tripathi. Uh, she's a writer and the founder editor of The Health Collective, a site dedicated to raising awareness on mental health. Tripathi writes contemporary fiction. Both her novels, Broken News and The Sibius Knot, deal with the darker side of urban realities, and she's been a journalist for close to 15 years. Uh, please, please join me in welcoming our panel. Thanks so much for that. And we're really happy to see all of you um, out here this afternoon. Um, and uh, very exciting to really be here in conversation uh, with Bill and Siddharth. Uh, we're uh, showing the presentation, so let's get straight into the, um, the heart of this conversation. And uh, of course, we will open for questions. Um, and I'll, I'll take a quick check of the, uh, of the room in about 20 minutes or so um, to see how many of you have questions uh, for our panel. Um, Bill, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about um, the new book of yours, which talks about this emergency response system in India, how it's working. And it, it says saving 2 million lives. It's something not all of us are familiar with. It'd be great to get straight into it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, go into that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the background that led uh, to this book. I've had a uh, lifelong career in healthcare as a scientist at Harvard University, doing fundamental research on cancer and AIDS. I've then had a business career where I've created uh, at least uh, 10 different biotechnology companies and brought eight drugs to the market. But through that career, I realized that that doesn't mean whether you do a scientific breakthrough or you bring a drug to the market, that people benefit. There are health systems that deliver health to people which are broken in almost every country. My own is broken. We have very good health for some people and poor health for many. Uh, the healthcare systems around the world need improving. I decided that I would look around the world for the best examples of healthcare and then for the hard part, look for people who would like to improve their own healthcare systems and create an organization, Access Health, which does three things. It is a think tank that looks around and documents and uh, uh, best practices. It advises governments and the private sector. And in some cases, we go so far as to help organizations restructure themselves to deliver better healthcare. I started my work here in India realizing that there were some very practical and very interesting, cost-effective ways to improve human health care uh, that most people weren't aware of. Uh, one of my mentors in this became a good friend of mine, C.K. Prahalad, that wrote a book uh, that many of you may know about. It's called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, which documents some very innovative, cost-effective mass solutions to a variety of different problems. And I began my work by looking at eye care in southern India. Um, we then began to look at various healthcare systems in central India, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, what's now Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. And about 10 years ago, came across a very interesting innovation, which was uh, ambulance care, uh, emergency care, police, fire, and uh, emergency. I saw it at its infancy, where it was beginning. In the last 10 years, 11 years now, it's expanded enormously. It's become one of the most, if not the most, effective healthcare providers in the world. Let me just give you a few numbers to uh, make that clear. This one service covers 750 million people, delivers ambulance care for 750 million people, and its imitators in a few other states cover the rest of the 1.2 billion people in this country. It is extremely efficient. Um, it takes in this kind of traffic, on average 15 minutes in a city and 25 minutes in the country to pick somebody up. Uh, they so far have saved over 2 million lives. Half of those, more or less, have been mothers and their infants during delivery. It provides service to tribal areas. They have boats that go in the river areas, like in Assam, 
They have ambulances that are basically stretchers in inaccessible tribal regions. And in these cities, you can see 108, uh, 108 EMRI or 108 from some other services. Um, it's free to the user. It solves many of the problems. Behind that idea is modern technology. It's the most advanced information system that tells you where the ambulances are going to be needed. It tells you at what time they're likely to be placed in a certain place. It tells you every detail you need to know about the patient experience. And in addition to that, uh, they do patient follow-up so they know how good the service has been. The average cost to the government for running this, and it is a government program uh, that is administered by the private sector. EMRI itself is a not-for-profit uh, institution. Uh, there are some for-profit and not-for-profit variants, but it is an amazing system. I've documented this system in this book that is being launched today called Every Second Counts, Saving Two Million Lives. Uh, it is one of the most effective systems in the world. Let me just give you a comparison. If we were to do this in the United States, we'd have probably five call centers for the entire country. We would save 200 times our cost and deliver service free to the user. I've recently, unfortunately, had the experience of using our ambulance system, and I got a bill for $575. Uh, for something that wasn't even voluntary. I didn't call the ambulance. Uh, it just came because the police had called it, and I got the bill for $575. In this country, you call it and you get it free, and the state pays for it, delivered by the public sector. There are many interesting lessons. I'd like to address for just a second the young people in the audience. I'm told something amazing about this uh, meeting is that over half the people are under 25. Well, healthcare, high-tech healthcare, is a wonderful career to think about. Um, it's the one job area that is secure. As economies rise and fall, healthcare providers do not. Uh, it's the one source of continual job growth in industrialized and in emerging economies. And it's a wonderful feeling to have a career for your lifetime where you're doing the best you can with all of your effort to help other people. So I strongly recommend this for all the young people who are thinking about the kinds of careers they uh, should have. And, yeah. <laughs> really with the potential to make such an enormous difference. Um, I think that's something you were highlighting as well. Uh, so Bill and Siddharth, to ask both of you, when it comes to something like this, where you see technology at the heart of innovation, um, that is capable of transforming uh, millions of lives and reaching, uh, touching millions of lives. Um, how important is it really? I mean, we don't want to get into all the systems that are broken, but how important is it to see that these are uh, scalable models, replicable models, um, and can you take us through some of the best practices uh, that you've been able to document? Well, at the heart of the emergency care system is an information technology. Uh, it was developed by one of the information technology companies, Satyam Computer, now Mahindra Technology, uh, which is one of the international providers of high-quality information systems to the major corporations and banks around the world. It was the founder's inspiration to use that to solve one of the critical problems in India, which was at the time emergency care, both medical care, fire, and police. And he put the full power of his information technology group 10 years ago, which had just emerged as uh, world class onto this. There are many, many problems that uh, I believe can be addressed the same way. One of the deep systematic problems that occurs throughout the world, in the United States, in China, in India, in many places, is the centralization of healthcare in a hospital. The last place you want to be when you're sick is a hospital. First of all, it's a dangerous place to be. Secondly, it's an expensive place to be. And the realization amongst advanced practitioners is what you really want to do is take care of people before they get sick and try to do your best to take care of them at home, in their communities, in India, in their villages. And the way to do that, I think, is pioneered by EMRI. It's using information technology to allow you to distribute healthcare equitably, fairly, uniformly, 
high quality throughout the health system. So whether it's getting a blood test, whether it is undergoing various procedures, the more you can peripheralize it, the more you use information technology, the better it will be for the entire population. Sure. Siddhartha, sure. I'm sure you have some questions and comments. Sure. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Amrita. Um, fundamentally, the uh, four pillars of a good health system and effective health systems are uh, you want a health system to be uh, accessible to everyone, you want it to be affordable, uh, you want it to be high quality, and you want it to be equitable. And uh, in terms of uh, the example that, that uh, Bill has taken, EMRI, uh, as well as fundamentally, technology is a, uh, is, a, is a great connector between all those four value pillars. Um, in terms of India's challenges in, the, in, in having universal health coverage, um, uh, cutting, technology cuts through the scale challenges, the complexities, as well as the resource constraints, because using data effectively could be a great way for India to, to really uh, apply the, the tremendous talent pool it has. Uh, India is known globally as a powerhouse around technology in solving and looking internally and solving its own problems. And here's a very good example how uh, you know, one particular uh, example over 10 years could really ne reach near universal levels and creating a kind of impact that could be replicable very well in other parts of the world. I mean, what's incredible also is that this story, um, as you said, is something that can be replicated. I mean, you can you can actually look at it as best practices. Um, so I was telling Bill and Siddharth and Anna earlier that you know we haven't heard this story, uh, which is great because this is why you know the book is so timely. Um, at the same time, you know, India is constantly. I mean, it, it does want to be uh, sort of a hub for innovation. Uh, obviously, and these marry several of our strengths when you look at tech and innovation. Um, are there any other lessons? Do you think that uh, because you did mention also that uh, it was uh, it's a it's a government but private uh, it's a partnership. It's, it's a public-private yeah, partnership. I think there are, are many general lessons that uh, can be learned uh, from this example. The first one is motivation. This program came to life from two separate motivations. A private player wanting to make a difference to health and understanding how it could be done through computer technology. But equally and perhaps even more importantly, the government that had a strong desire to improve health care for its people. That was the government of Andhra Pradesh at the time. It is an enormously popular uh, service. In fact, this plus uh, the hospital care that was pioneered there is thought to be worth four percentage points in election. Four for you, minus four for your competitor. And as a result of that, has been rolled out very rapidly throughout most of the country. So I think the public-private partnership and understanding who those people are. Second is, one of the things we do as a foundation is we look around the world to find other people who would like to solve their problems. And one thing I think this country should be proud of is the advances it's made in certain parts of the medical system. Most people, when they think about India, don't think of healthcare excellence. They think of other things. But here is a system which is not paralleled anywhere in the world. And there are other pockets of excellence. For example, eye care. Nowhere in the world does eye care like you do here in India. And th there are cases now where it's replicated. Let me give you an example. This system, the ambulance system, is now being rolled out in Sri Lanka. Uh, the eye care systems are available that were pioneered here are available in Egypt, several sub-Saharan African countries, several South American countries, and we've documented uh, some of that work. And there's many, many other examples here uh, that can be uh, emulated. There's one other advantage that I think that Siddhartha will talk about, which is education. What's, um, um, this particular innovation um, has led to the creation of uh, over 300,000 uh, tra trained community uh, volunteers uh, spread across all villages and districts, the remotest parts of India. Um, so one great way uh, uh, to apply technology is to really distribute or create roles in the community uh, that, that match the talent pool and the, and the resources that are available. And this could also be a very major employment generator creating a resilient communities which has all the information, the latest medical information, and the way to uh, connect remote communities with points of definitive care. 
And I think the, uh, the medical education aspect of really decentralizing talent pool and making healthcare available and delivering uh, care close to where communities live um, is, is a very important aspect that has been uh, true uh, probably for almost all the high quality health systems uh, that we, we observe. Let me just make one other point about the education. Most of the people who are the emergency techs are high school graduates. There is the most modern form of education, that a very systematic program uh, that uses the highest tech tools, including intelligent dummies that mimic a, a woman giving birth, that give uh, uh, the, the practitioner or the student the idea of what it's like to deal with somebody who's ingested a uh, toxin or is suffering a heart attack. It's a thorough education that prepares them for real experiences that they're going to have. And it's a model, I believe, for how you educate people for specific tasks that have a high school gradu graduate degree. Yeah. And so you said 300,000 people over 10 years um, have been educated with this. Um, I think it's fascinating because, you know, we do hear, of course, of India as, uh, you know, sometimes it's called the pharmacy for the world because of the, um, what we see in the, in the pharma industry, in the genetics. Um, it is a hot spot for medical tourism for many neighboring nations. But in, in this case, it sounds also that, um, like it is, it could be that sort of beacon or, uh, you know, best case study for when it comes to innovation, innovation and tech. Um, I know that there are other cases of innovation that you've seen over the last few years. Uh, Siddhartha was mentioning the 104. Are, are there any other examples you want to give us? Um, So I think uh, the example here, uh, the emergency example, uh, India also has a system where um, non-emergency uh, uh, you know, beneficiaries or prospective uh, patients can universally call in uh, to a number 104 in about uh, 10 states uh, you know, in India. The call is attended to by paramedics uh, who uh, look at uh, the computer and triaging, uh, software triaging as a way to answer most of the questions, the common questions. Well, I'm not well for the last three days, four days. I'm having flu-like symptoms. What could that be? Where can I get help? In many, many cases, those answers using technology can be solved over the phone or a very reliable uh, service could be provided in terms of connecting a, pro a, a patient or a caller with uh, the, the right uh, points of definitive care. So again, that brings back to the co concept of using technology, riding on the back backbone of uh, near universal infrastructure for telecommunications that's available in the country, yeah. and really using applied principles of you know, medicine and making sure uh, that everybody uh, in the country is connected. They know uh, whom to contact, where to contact, and they get very reliable services over phone in most cases. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask the audience a question. How many of you have an ADAR card? Can you raise your hand? I'd like the people who aren't from India to look around the room, all right? And the answer is everybody who's an Indian has an ADAR card. Uh, that is one of the most fundamental advances for a country. The only country in the world that I know that does something like that is Estonia with 1.2 million people. There are probably 1.2 million people in Jaipur uh, with an ADAR card. That is the basis for communication between your government and yourself, between yourself and your healthcare systems eventually, between yourself and your financial systems. It's an amazing innovation. And that innovation done here in India across 1.2 billion people is unknown outside of this country. Like the ambulance system is unknown outside of this country. There are fantastic innovations in which this country is leading the world and other people should follow. Uh, and it's one of the tasks that we have to make that possible. So I think, Adhar, we have some, uh, there are many concerns being raised in terms of surveillance and privacy, but this isn't uh, the space for that conversation. Uh, I do want to ask you, you know, when you're talking about things that aren't being done anywhere else in the world, uh, here again, uh, you talk about how the core of what they're doing with the emergency service bill, that it's tech, there's also real-time information which leads to constant self-improvement. Will you take us through a little bit of that? Well, one of the things that happens is systems are never static, and a good system is self-repairing, learning from its mistakes, and moving forward. So at every step of the way, there is an analysis. Because you have all the data, 
in real time that is captured for the entire period of operation. You can look, for example, a question. How many rings does it take for somebody to pick up the phone and answer? The answer today is less than two, but when they started, it was much more than two. How long does it take between the time the call comes in to the time the dis ambulance is dispatched? It was more than five or six minutes. It's now less than two minutes. Those seconds make a difference to people's lives. If you had a car accident and you're bleeding, they have a, make a really big difference. What has been the patient experience after the whole thing is over? How can we optimize it? What hospitals should we take people to? We have the data of what people experience. Can we make it better? Can we select these hospitals and not those hospitals? Do we know this is where we should take a heart attack patient and this is where we should take a broken bone? There are many types of analysis that are involved in continual improvement and continual learning. And I think that's one of the other great advantages of uh, technology. That is something that I think um, uh, people will be delighted to hear a little bit more about. I'm going to just do a quick check if anyone has any questions, uh, because are, that's great. Okay, we'll start uh, moving the mic around. There are so many strands to this conversation, so we'll try and see um, what we can do in terms of answering this. There's a question here in the front row, and then the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much <coughs> for an informative discussion about your work, your innovative work. Um, my name's Wendy, I'm from Australia. Um, I, I see there's a tendency internationally, um, and I'm going international here, um, for funding to be moved away from um, health prevention, uh, such as public education, and more to treatment once a person has become ill, for example, in the case of diabetes, <clears throat> which I think is partly driven by the pharmaceutical companies. I'm just wondering what your comment uh, would be on that. Thank you. The, uh, a, a quick way of phrasing what you've just heard is a dollar spent for treatment is a dollar not spent for prevention. I don't believe that's true. Uh, there is room for a dollar spent for prevention and a dollar spent for treatment. And in fact, the border is now being a little bit mixed. Let's take diabetes. A lot of people get diabetes and they get it because of bad diet or a bad habit or whatever else, and we like to change that. But once you get it, you can prevent amputation, blindness, and many of the other symptoms by appropriate local treatment. So the, the, the blend between prevention of progression of disease and, and prevention of the disease itself is a, becoming a lot more blurred. And I think that's again where technology has a major role to play with identifying early what is about to happen and intervening to prevent it from happening and getting worse. There's one question there. Yeah. Um, I work in the healthcare sector in India, and my question is to Siddharth. Uh, you spoke about the four basic uh, you know, tenets of a healthcare system being affordable, accessible, high quality, replicable. Um, and my question in healthcare delivery today is that land comes at a cost. Manpower doesn't come cheap. Um, there is no make in India. It's a pipe dream as of now. So all the diagnostic equipment is uh, imported into the country at a high cost. So my question is, when the input costs are so high, how do you make the output cost affordable? So um, I think the essence of, uh, of a good healthcare system is also decentralization. India has 1.2 billion people. If you really think about an universal health coverage model, then the input cost really gets spread over a very large section of the population. Bringing, exactly because of the challenge, that land is scarce, uh, finding all the uh, trained manpower into one uh, particular city or one particular district in India is very, very difficult. Using technology really to uh, shape the delivery system or making it an integral partner to the delivery system and really taking the service to where it is required is one great way to overcoming some of the infrastructural bottleneck challenges. For example, if you want to really take, uh, have a hospital and uh, you, know, you are looking at really uh, bringing uh, somebody from 100 kilometers away on a regular basis, some of the mix, uh, the India's healthcare requirements are moving uh, towards non-communicable diseases, for example, chronic diseases. And somebody would have to come very, very frequently to a hospital 100 kilometers away. 
and that will create a significant barrier uh, in, uh, in, in, in access, as well as affordability, as well as quality. So I think the, the way to overcome this really is to take the services and really make it a patient-centered integrated system where the right service is available at the right place. Uh, let me say cost is a really big issue in healthcare. In our country, we spend 20% of our gross domestic product without talking about wellness on health, on healthcare. It's uh, $3.3 trillion uh, today. In Singapore, and I've written a book on the Singapore healthcare system, the government spends what you spend, about 1.5% of GDP, and the private sector spends another 3.5% for a total of slightly less than 4% of its GDP. Singapore has one of the best healthcare systems in the world amongst the top 10. The United States is down around 50, number 50 in healthcare. So we spend more than four times as much and we get much poorer results. There are a lot of ways, and one of the things we focus on is your question. How do you get high quality healthcare at a cost a country can afford? And we believe it is possible, and some of the best examples are here in India. There are examples other places we look at as well. Okay. My question is to the panel. Uh, going by the current Indian healthcare scenario where 70% of the healthcare is being uh, provided by the private players, how do you see, uh, because, and so does the innovations in healthcare, are again being driven by the private players who are uh, partnering with the government sector in uh, providing healthcare. But the current policies of the Indian government are not at all conducive for private entrepreneurs or for private healthcare providers. How do you see these innovations and continuum of healthcare in India? Uh, one of the things that's characteristic of uh, EMRI is that it is a public-private partnership. It's paid for partly by Central and partly by the states, and the service is entirely provided by private players. EMRI is a not-for-profit uh, organization, uh, and so is, is uh, 104. So this is an example where that works. You would look at Arogashri, the pro programs for universal health care in uh, Central India and, and the similar programs. They provide uh, payment to both pri public and private hospitals on an equal basis for the same uh, issue and about three quarters of the uh, care is delivered by uh, the private sector. It's a very important issue to work out and India in some places is in advance of many other countries in understanding how to work with public-private partnerships. It is a very fraught issue of how to work out those relationships, as I'm sure you're aware. But it is, I think, an interesting example where that is being done. There are many ways to abuse public-private systems. Um, let me just take elder care in Sweden, of all places. A lot of elder care in Sweden was privatized. They had some abuses, and the government fell. So it's not a panacea without real care, but it is, in some cases, a viable solution. Thank you. There's a question there. Yeah. My name is Satish. I have a very simple question. So today we see that the whole ecosystem of healthcare is reactive. When a person falls sick or meets with a certain circumstance, how do we solve it? Uh, so now we have solutions to treat diabetes patients, cardiac patients, and then there are business models that are there to solve that problem. How do we move from that to a more proactive model where let's say a 20 year old needs to do certain things so that he doesn't fall sick in the first place till the time he is 50 or 60? So uh, one uh, of the defining aspects of India's health system is significantly large out of pocket expenditure. Uh, so if you really look at it, it's, it's, it's close to 60% or even in some states even higher than that. And what uh, out-of-pocket expenditure does is uh, it fragments you know, the, the healthcare providers, the seekers uh, as a whole. I think as you see in the last few years continually as the sources of financing for healthcare in India are uh, getting streamlined and it's getting centralized. Uh, and there has been a significant focus in the last five to 10 years then, uh, you know, driving and ensuring that, uh, you know, the care continuum is made patient-centered, which means that you really guide patients in, in a certain case based on eligibility and entitlement in the right places. You use data to look at a continuum and drive efficiency. That gets significantly better. From a design point of view, what you are mentioning uh, at, the, at the scale at which India operates, it would require, require unified 
financing along with the unified delivery systems. And I think that those efforts in many states and at the national level are on as we speak. Thanks for the question. Okay, there's a lady in the back in the red and her neighbor. Hello. My question is that I have noticed through my healthcare research that worldwide there seems to be a shift from treatment-based to outcome-based systems. And in what way could big data help towards that journey? Well, thank you for answering, asking that question. One of the things we are focused on is exactly that transition from input measurement for quality to output patient, output data for uh, measurement. Uh, one of the things that information systems allow you to do today, if they're deployed properly, is understand what you've done for input, every single aspect of uh, things that you put into uh, a patient. What are the fixed costs? What are the variable costs? And what is the outcome? What exactly is the outcome per patient? You can compare doctor to doctor, process to process, unit to unit, hospital to hospital, region to region. That's what big data allows you to do. And if you make it real time, it becomes actionable, actionable at the top administrative level. But more interestingly, if you make it transparent so that everybody in the system can see their performance versus everybody else's, it draws upon the natural interest of people in healthcare who are in that field anyway because they want to make a difference to improve their own performance. And we've seen, I've seen personally a system that uses real-time, transparent, comprehensive information systems to improve from lower, 10 years ago this system that I'm thinking about was at the bottom third of quality and safety. Today it's number one in the United States for the last three to four years in quality and safety using big data, real time information that's not only available to senior management, but is available to everybody in the organization so they can judge their own behavior and take actions to improve it. And I think that is one of the biggest lessons for information technology in the modern age. I'm writing a book called World Class Successful Management in the, in the Information Age, which draws upon this as the example. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, just Hi. one second, we have a question in the front, and then we'll try and take a couple together so we can uh, maximize um, the time. Yeah, hi. I share the concern of our friend who said um, that there's not much funding in non-communicable diseases and for prevention and health promotion. Uh, I've lived in Australia myself for a couple of years, and uh, because the government is paying for our health expenses, it's, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on health promotion because there's a, a certain amount that you want to pay. You don't want to invest in treatment care. So, um, if like, if we want to achieve universal health coverage in a country like India or in Southeast Asia region, uh, what is, what is uh, your take on that? Uh, for me, UHC, the answer is accessibility. What, what would you say about that? Okay. And uh, can we take the question in the back and then we'll get both? My question is that uh, uh, while working with people, we have observ uh, observed that there is a lot of indigenous knowledge that goes beyond treating the symptoms and goes towards treating the disease itself rather than treating the symptoms. So what place we have in the uh, healthcare for holistic uh, uh, treatment or indigenous knowledge or local knowledge, so to say? Holistic treatment or indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Uh, I'll deal with the first question while you take the, the second. Um, there have been three or four questions already on the topic of prevention versus treatment. Let me just say that the demand that you in the audience have and your parents and your grandparents is for treatment. That's the real demand. And if you don't get treatment, you are extremely unhappy because you will die or get worse. And so there's an enormous demand and society meets that demand from treatment. There is much less a demand for prevention. Do you really want people to tell you not to eat a, drink a large Diet Coke? or eat a McDonald's hamburger? You want the government to be telling you what to do? Do you really enjoy the fact that if you want to smoke, you can only smoke in like a tiny little area? No, you don't enjoy that. There isn't the same kind of demand. It isn't what should be, it's what is. The demand is for health. 
what we try to do is figure out how to meet that demand equitably at a cost that a society can afford in a way that gives high quality outcomes. There are really legitimate questions about what prevention can do, and prevention can have a major role, and we've seen that. Uh, but it isn't where the, the, the demand is, and if you don't provide the health care, fundamental health care treatment needs, you are going to be a very unpopular government and a very unpopular system. Taking on the second question around uh, treatment around symptoms, uh, uh, as uh, we all recognize, uh, there are different uh, streams of uh, medicine that are practiced in different parts of India. However, I think uh, uh, it's very important that in good health systems, there is an evidence-backed uh, a backbone, uh, which is a clinical, uh, which determines the clinical pathways based on uh, science as well as, you know, in terms of uh, evidences, which also is uh, within the scope of the regulators of the country. So I think to some extent, each of these uh, aspects uh, on, on symptoms eventually has to sit on a broader framework, both that is cleared by regulators as well as is connected to a, uh, to a series of uh, evidence-backed clinical pathways, which leads to, uh, uh, to, to, to better health outcomes uh, across the country. Okay, so we have loads of questions uh, left, but I'm so sorry, uh, we could be, uh, we'll have time for one more, and perhaps we, uh, you can find Bill and Siddharth uh, elsewhere at the fest. Uh, definitely take, uh, keep an eye out for the book. Um, the girl with the mic. Um, I just had two questions. Hi. Try and crunch them into one. Yeah, uh, so basically one thing is, you spoke a lot about the campaigns that are going on for uh, tip lines like 104 and 108 ambulances. But uh, what is being done in hospitals, specifically private ones? And uh, in your years of experience, for both of you, have you noticed any gender disparity when it comes to healthcare? Gender disparity. One of the things we work on is how to make hospital care better, improve the quality, and secondly, how to make it more distributed, how to integrate it between village, community, smaller hospital and larger hospital. Those are the kinds of issues uh, that we work on. Are there gender inequalities? One of the biggest problems uh, that we're focused on, we have specific programs where we actually go down to the implementation phase where we are trying to reduce uh, infant mortality and maternal mortality. Uh, we've done, we started off about five, maybe six, seven years ago with a survey of what we thought were the best practices in 300 maternal mortality, maternal child programs around the country. We've then helped distill those down to a series of, of practices. It doesn't mean that women get the same health care treatment as men. Actually, if you look at 108 or 104, the call ratio between men and women, it's 80% men. 20% women. So usually, even today, most of the calls that come in are men calling. They may be calling for their families, but it's a, a dramatic uh, change, uh, di difference uh, in the sex ratio, and one that I wouldn't have necessarily expected. And so that, I mean, final comments from you, because this is something that obviously societally and systemically, I think, is some, uh, something that needs to be dealt with from a community level. Yeah, I think the, um, since the focus of uh, a lot of the discussion has been around technology. Um, we do recognize that uh, the curative aspect, uh, uh, you know, uh, is one component of an overall uh, uh, care continuum. And uh, wellness, uh, there's a whole domain around wellness, nutrition, uh, whole domain among active, healthy living styles, lifestyles, communication, uh, that goes down all the way into communities. Um, that could be integrated into these, uh, these pathways, and it's very important that, uh, that we uh, go down and think about the, the effective ways, good examples. Right. There are very good examples outside India that uh, in countries uh, which have significantly reduced their expenditure, been more efficient, more high quality by integrating these two, right. and it's a matter of time that you know, in India we see that in future. Okay. Bill, final words. And I'd just like to uh, end where I began. That for me, personally, healthcare has been a wonderful avocation. It's been a great journey from fundamental research to application of that research to creating new medicines and now to working on a broader picture. It's a field that is very broad, very deep, and is deeply personally rewarding, and that I would encourage all of you to think about how healthcare 
can fit into your lives, whether it is as a career or as a person who would like to advocate for better health care for all those around them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's love. Thank you so much. And a big uh, round of applause also, uh, not just for our panel, but for the wonderful vol volunteers. And of course, it's been a great crowd. Thank you so much. Thank you once again to our speakers, as well as to the session sponsors, Access Health International. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we have a wonderful session coming up with some authors, which is entitled, Words Are All We Have. So hold tight, 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah.